Charlie Sheen recently got an offer in compromise approved by the IRS that shaved millions of dollars off his IRS tax bill. Wow, winning. And in this video, I'm going to go over exactly how he got this offer in compromise approved. It was a very lengthy battle with the IRS. Hats off to his CPA, Stephen Jager, who represented Charlie all the way to tax court and beyond to help him win this one. And then at the end of this video, I'm going to give you a five lessons that you can learn from Charlie She's offer in compromise case that you can use for your own tax debt. So stick around to the end, but first let me talk about this myth going around. There's a myth going around that if you have any assets whatsoever, well, you can't possibly get an offer in compromise approved by the IRS. In our office, we routinely talk to people who believe this when they call in. We just talked to a guy last week who watched a Dave Ramsey clip that I'll show you here in a second. And based on that Dave Ramsey clip was convinced that you couldn't get an offer in compromise approved unless you had, and I quote Dave, absolutely no income and no assets. And that's absolutely not true at all. If you've seen my video on the offer and compromise formula, you know the reality is much, much more complicated than that. And in fact, due to the IRS's quick sale value calculation that I discussed in that video, you could have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity in various assets and possibly still qualify for an offer and compromise. Anyway, here's a Dave Ramsey clip in which Dave is talking to an individual with $55,000 in IRS debt, and he basically perpetuates this common misconception about the offer and compromise that you have to basically have nothing to qualify for one. So you've, the got, pandemic, so you've I got the IRS money. on a payment plan? Uh, no, I actually applied for a, um, a an offer in compromise, but I haven't heard from them yet. It's, you're, it's been you're a very gonna, slow... You're going to be denied. Okay. Um, you have to you have to be able to show pauper status, absolutely no income and no assets to get an OIC through. That's one of the great mythologies. How much did you pay for this OIC application? I put it down six thousand oh, dollars. Oh man. <sighs> yeah. Uh, okay. Don't give me more money. Um, okay. Yeah. That. That's a. Um, there's just very. I've been doing this 30 years. I've seen two of those go through. Two. And uh, and in both cases, we were working with a uh, tax attorney, and you prove that they have no assets at all and no income and really no potential of income, and so they really believe that you're virtually financially dead and you're not, you make $55,000 a year. So they're gonna put you on a 900 year payment plan. Eventually, I wanna create a dedicated video responding to this Dave Ramsey clip point by point. In the meantime, get this Dave, if you're watching. Recently, multimillionaire actor Charlie Sheen, who makes a lot more than $55,000 a year, like this caller did, Charlie Sheen got an offer in compromise approved by the IRS to settle his tax debt for less than he owed. So Dave, Charlie ha has income, he has assets. Charlie actually worked with a CPA to get his offering compromise approved. So Dave, the matter of fact is that you can get an offering compromise approved with income, with assets. And you can use a tax attorney, like you said, uh, if you want. Many tax attorneys are great and they're very skilled in their craft, but a CPA or enrolled agent and EA can represent taxpayers before the IRS as well. So Dave, here's what Charlie has to say about your take on who qualifies for an offering compromise. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Stop. Move forward. Of course, Charlie Sheen's offer and compromise wasn't a pennies on the dollar offer and compromise. Most offers and compromise actually are not pennies on the dollar settlements. But nevertheless, the IRS accepted an offer amount from Charlie for millions of dollars less than he owed the government. Charlie was able to cut his IRS debt by potentially more than half. And that was despite Charlie at the time owning and later selling an 8,628 square foot home in Beverly Hills, another home in Ventura County, property of unknown value in Rosarito, Mexico, and obviously earning some income from his Hollywood career. My name is Logan Alec. I'm a tax relief CPA and owner of Choice Tax Relief, where we represent everyday Americans who are in tax trouble with the IRS and or their state. You can get a free consultation with us by calling 866-8000-TAX. That's 866-8000-829 or by filling out a quick form at choicetaxrelief.com. So now let's dig into the details of Charlie's case. This is an excellent 
excellent educational uh, study in the tax relief process. For those of you at home, please keep in mind that the years long path it took Charlie Sheen to get his offer and compromise approved is not typical. There were a few tax court petitions along the way. This is obviously a high profile case with millions of dollars on the line. The typical offer and compromise takes between us uh, seven and 12 months. Right now for the IRS to make a decision on it, could take a bit longer than that depending on the situation. Watch my video, how long does an offer and compromise take for more information on the timeline you could expect when submitting an offer and compromise. So I'm not saying offers compromise are a walk in the park. They take time, but generally not as much time as Charlie Sheen's case did to get resolved. So now let's go over Charlie Sheen's tax troubles and then I'll talk about the very lengthy process that he went through to get an offer and compromise approved by the IRS. So Charlie owed almost $7 million to the IRS for tax years 2015, 2017, and 2018. Aren't there moments where a guy like crashes and is like in the corner like, oh my God. Charlie was not audited for these years. These were returns that Charlie Sheen filed or his accountant filed and Charlie just didn't pay the tax or he didn't pay all the tax. Even if you can't pay, that's the smart thing to do, okay? Because if you file your taxes and you don't pay, you're only hit with a half a percent per month fair to pay penalty. But if you don't file your tax returns and you don't pay the tax due, you're hit not only with the fair to pay penalty, but also the failure to file penalty. Though for the first five months, the fair to pay penalty is subtracted from the fair to file penalty. But anyway, Charlie filed his 2015, 2017, and 2018 1040 tax returns, and his combined liability on those returns, plus penalties and interest, uh, was about $7 million. And according to Charlie Sheen's representative, who represented him in tax court, CPA Stephen Jager, yes, some CPAs can be admitted to practice in tax court, just, just like a tax attorney. Charlie was assigned a very aggressive revenue officer. But to tell the whole story here, let's go back to early 2018. In early 2018, Charlie's only tax debt was from his 2015 return because he hadn't filed his 2017 or 2018 tax returns yet. And he owed about $5.7 million on that 2015 return. So what happens when you owe the IRS money and you file your return and you don't pay? Well, they send you a series of notices and I've gone over these notices before in other videos. These notices start off friendly enough, usually with the notice CP14, that's basically just the IRS telling you that you owe such and such amount in taxes, penalties, and interest, that the taxpayer doesn't respond. They might get the notice CP501, then another notice, then another notice, and uh, then eventually they'll get something called the final notice of intent to levy on using LT11 or 1058. And this final notice of intent to levy informs a taxpayer that if they don't pay the IRS within 30 days, the IRS can start taking their stuff, garnishing wages, levying bank accounts, etc. And that can get really ugly really fast. It's called forced collection activity. The IRS can also file a notice of federal tax lien against a taxpayer, which would inform the public, including any other creditors or potential creditors that the IRS is going to get theirs before they get theirs, <laughs> with some exceptions. So Charlie presumably received all these notices from the IRS and the IRS did actually file notice of federal tax lien against him for the 2015 tax year. But one thing you can do during that 30 day period after you, you receive the final notice of intent to levy is file for something called a collection due process hearing, also called a CDP hearing with the IRS Office of Appeals using form 12153 that will prevent the IRS from taking your stuff at least until a final decision is made by appeals. You can also do this in response to the filing of a notice of federal tax lien. And if the taxpayer disagrees with appeals in their CDP hearing, then they would have the right to petition the tax court and argue their case there. So effectively by filing a collection due process hearing, a CDP hearing, and then if appeals rejects the taxpayer's argument in the hearing, filing a tax court petition, a taxpayer can keep the IRS's forced collection activities at bay for some time. And the basis for all these processes is the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which protects the people of the United States from unreasonable searches and seizures, with IRS forced collection activity obviously being an example of a seizure. And so the purpose of a CDP hearing is to ensure that the IRS is following the proper procedures that it must follow when collecting a tax debt. And this CDP hearing, this is what Charlie did in April 2018. He got all these notices. IRS actually filed a notice of federal tax lien against him. And his business manager at this point in early 2018, I don't think Charlie was even being represented by a tax professional. His business manager was handling all this is my understanding. So his business manager filed form 12153 to request a CDP hearing in response to this filing of a notice of federal tax lien. And at this point in early 2018, all Charlie's going for with the IRS is to stop forced collection activity and set up 
an installment agreement with them on his $5.7 million of tax debt for 2050. He's not even going for an offer compromise here. He just wants time to pay. On the form 12153, you used to request a CDP hearing in box nine. You indicate the proposed collection alternative that you want to propose to the IRS in lieu of them taking your stuff immediately. And all Charlie put, or all his business manager put on that 12153 was a proposal for an installment agreement. Like I said, they're not even going for a settlement and offering compromise at this point. So Charlie's case goes to appeals for a CDP hearing with the goal of getting Charlie into an installment agreement. But in appeals, the IRS appeals officer told Charlie and his business manager that he wanted Charlie's complete and accurate Form 433A back within 14 days. So the Form 433A is the IRS's collection information statement. On this document, you list out all of your income, your net equity and assets, and your expenses. And there are certain rules and standards about how to value things and how to determine your expenses. They have these standards that kind of cap your expenses. I've gone over those in other videos. And the IRS and tax representatives like myself and my staff at Choice Tax Relief, we go back and forth and we, we bicker about these numbers with the IRS and we support documentation for these numbers to support them when the IRS pushes back. And the figures on these Form 433As, Form 433A OICs, 433Bs, 433B OICs, and Form 433Fs, different forms depending on what you're going for and where your case is, whether it's an ACS or the revenue officer, the figures on these forms do become a real point of contention in IRS negotiations and resolution. So it's important that when we submit them on behalf of our clients, they're accurate and defensible. And this can take time. And if you work with my firm for tax resolution, we've probably put together one of these forms for you. This is when we're asking you all these questions about how much you make and what you spend your money on every month and, and your assets and your liabilities and, and documentation for all that. And this form can take weeks to complete and fill out for just average everyday folks we represent. So you can imagine how much more complicated Charlie Sheen's financial situation is. So Charlie's business manager asked the IRS appeals officer for more than 14 days, which is what the appeals officer originally gave him, to complete the Form 433A, but the appeals officer denied the request. So it's my understanding that at this point, Charlie and the business manager decided to get a tax professional involved. So they first contacted a tax attorney here in the Los Angeles area, Robert Schriebman, who apparently agreed to take the case on a short-term basis because he's nearing retirement. And remember, at this point, all Sheen is shooting for is an installment agreement. In my understanding, a full payment installment agreement, an agreement to pay the amount he owes the IRS over time. Well, the IRS appeals officer still denied the request for more time to complete the Form 433A, even with the attorney involved, and therefore did not even entertain the notion of an installment agreement. He believed that Charlie had the means to pay his tax debt in full immediately. No installment agreement. So at this point, Charlie's only recourse was to petition the tax court, because he didn't win in the CDP hearing, to argue that the IRS appeals officer abused his discretion in denying a request for more time. Charlie Sheen's tax attorney, Mr. Shreedman, filed this tax court petition in July 2018, claiming that the settlement officer abused his discretion by refusing to consider and grant Charlie an installment payment agreement. And eventually, Charlie's attorney, Robert Shreedman, handed the case over to a CPA, Stephen Jager. Stephen Jager was actually the one who took this case home. Mr. Shreeman did that because apparently he's in the middle of winding down his law practice from what I understand. So now it's early 2020, okay? Charlie Sheen's tax court petition has been, been filed, right? And in January 2020, Charlie's CPA, Stephen Jager, filed an offer in compromise for Charlie Sheen's 2015, 2017, and 2018 tax debt, because now those last 2017 and 2018 had been filed, which combined for all those three years was about $7 million. The amount of this offer in compromise was $1.2 million, $1,240,115 to be exact. And two IRS employees, two offer specialists at the IRS reviewed this offer, Sherry E. Roy in Monroe, Louisiana, and Neri D. Earl in Birmingham, Alabama. And in July 2020, offer specialist Earl recommended rejection for this offer in compromise since she determined that Charlie Sheen could fully pay his tax liability. In fact, according to tax notes, apparently they determined that his reasonable collection potential, the amount he could afford to pay the IRS, was something like nine to 12 million. So then Charlie's CPA, Stephen Jager, uh, took Charlie's case to appeals in another CDP hearing on November 18, 2020. And in this hearing, Charlie's CPA and the appeals settlement officer, whose name was Brian St. Germain, basically went through officer specialist Nari Earls, who rejected Charlie's offer in compromise, they went through the offer specialist analysis of the rejection and went through it point by point, okay? 
Apparently, Charlie CPA wrote a very comprehensive rebuttal of the offer specialist detailed analysis of her view of Charlie's reasonable collection potential. And it was this six page comprehensive memorandum that Charlie CPA put together that served as the working document for the intensive negotiations that followed during the CDP hearing held on November 18, 2020. And as each issue is fully discussed and addressed, Charlie CPA saw the appeals settlement officer was making notes. He was annotating and referencing this document that Charlie CPA put together to the applicable sections of the Internal Revenue Manual to support each and every concession that was made by the settlement officer when convinced to make any concession and conversely to note any concession made by Charlie CPA. So basically, IRS rejected Charlie's offer and compromise. And they sent this big old letter, point by point, of, of, of why Charlie's offer and compromise should be rejected. Charlie CPA took that letter that that offer specialist wrote, and rebutted it point by point, and in this appeals hearing, the CDP hearing, uh, Charlie CPA and the appeals settlement officer basically went back and forth with this, okay? So uh, that's where we're at. And apparently though, Charlie CPA and the IRS appeals officer uh, couldn't agree on Charlie Sheen's reasonable collection potential. So Charlie CPA suggested a future income collateral agreement. A future income collateral agreement is when an offer in compromise amount is accepted on the condition that if the taxpayer starts making more than a certain amount of money in the future, the government, the IRS, will get a share of that as part of the offer. So in February 2021, we're fast forwarding to February 2021 now, Charlie CPA and the appeals officer agreed to revise the offer amount to about $3.1 million, $3,130,420 to be exact, as computed by the appeals officer apparently. Now, I don't have the documents of what, you know, exactly what they went over in this negotiation, but I do think Charlie CPA was very smart going into this. I think he knew that the IRS was gonna reject Charlie Sheen's original offer and compromise amount, apart from some amount that would be very close to his actual tax set of approximately $7 million. So he went pretty low, right, at 1.2 million. I don't know how, Maybe he got some very conservative appraisers or something like that to appraise the value of Charlie's properties. I don't know. I haven't seen those documents and his support for those figures. But, and this is frankly our strategy with offers and compromises as well, because he went low, he was able to give concessions to the IRS appeals officer to the tune of almost $2 million, which resulted in that amended offer and compromise amount being okay by the appeals officer. And this offer amount of 3.1 million, you know, it's a heck of a lot less than 7 million, right? So he went from 1.2 to 3.1, which is still a good deal. And this $3.1 million offer was even approved by the IRS Office of the Chief Counsel, which is the IRS's legal department. And apparently Charlie also at this point had already paid in $626,084 as his 20% offer and compromise down payment, because this was apparently a lump sum offer and compromise rather than a periodic payment offer and compromise in which 20% down isn't required. If you wanna learn more about the differences between a lump sum offer and a periodic payment offer, check out my video on the offer and compromise formula. In that video, I go over exactly how much to offer and compromise to the IRS. Link to that video is at the top of the screen and in the description below. Because as you know, if you've seen my other videos on offers and compromise, so if you're submitting a lump sum offer and compromise, unless you qualify for low income certification, you have to submit 20% down along with your offer and then pay off the remaining offer amount within five Five months of offer acceptance. But Charlie is far from done with this tax tail. Charlie's $3.1 million offer and compromise had been accepted by the settlement officer and IRS lawyers, but it had to go further up the chain. It had to get a higher blessing than this, a blessing from the appeal settlement officer and a blessing from IRS chief counsel. Charlie's offer went up to the IRS appeals director for the Los Angeles area, and this guy rejected it. Even after all these other individuals at the IRS said it was fine, legally sufficient, and after Charlie already made his 20% down payment, the appeals director for the LA area rejected it. So his 3.1 million offer on a $7 million of tax set is, is now rejected. The appeals director found that the original reviewers of Charlie's offer and compromise were correct in calculating his reasonable collection potential, right? How much he could pay the government. The appeals director determined that Charlie Sheen could fully pay his tax liability, so why would the IRS accept an offer and compromise? And apparently, according to Charlie's CPA, the area director didn't even explain why he rejected it. And we know this because in the November 2021 tax court petition filed by Charlie's CPA, he wrote, the commissioner and the named party in tax court cases is the IRS commissioner in his or her capacity as the commissioner. It's like a stylistic thing. The commissioner has abused his discretion by not acting in good faith, nor in dealing fairly with petitioner. The, the petitioner here is Charlie Sheen. Specifically, the Los Angeles area director in reviewing this otherwise accepted offer failed to either communicate directly with petitioner's representative, i.e. CPA Stephen Jager, or to otherwise instruct and advise the settlement officer 
the fellow who had previously accepted the offer to communicate precisely what his, the area director's, specific concerns were concerning the offer and to afford petitioner, Charlie Sheen, a reasonable and fair opportunity to respond to these concerns. This is a clear breach of the duty of good faith and fair dealing, which is implicit in every contract. And get this. The appeals area director wouldn't even approve an installment agreement for Charlie because he believed that Charlie had assets that he could liquidate to fully pay his $7 million tax liability to the government. They said, your OIC was rejected by the appeals area director who found that compliance was correct in its calculation of your reasonable collection potential. Appeals determines that your OIC is rejected as you can full pay your liability. Appeals determined an installment agreement is not appropriate as you have assets that can be liquidated to pay your liability. So the appeals director told Charlie Sheen, go kick rocks, buddy, sell your stuff, sell your houses, pay the $7 million immediately. And on that installment agreement note, apparently appeals determined that, that Charlie's monthly disposable income was $51,275 per month. So if Charlie paid that amount of money, $51,275 a month in an installment agreement, beginning in November 2020, when this appeals hearing happened, let's say, all the way until his last year for which he has tax debt, until that year's tax debt drops off, I don't know exactly when that would be. I don't know when his 2018 tax was assessed, right? Usually their virus is 10 years to collect from the date a tax is assessed, but they would have been extended in Charlie's case because he had these offers and compromise pending and he had these CDP hearings and, and things like that. But, you know, let's say it's nine years and some change, right? He'd be paying $51,275, let's just say nine years, right? So that math would come out to cumulative payments of $5,537,700, right? Which is less than $7 million he owed. So that would be a partial payment installment agreement or a PPIA. Appeals director didn't like that option either. IRS's conclusion was uh, the amount that was determined by appeals, $51,275 per month, would be a part pay installment agreement, meaning the amount would not fully pay your liability with the collection statutes. You would first have to liquidate assets to pay off your liability. As a result, an installment agreement is not a viable alternative in this case at this time. So <laughs> that Los Angeles area appeals director really didn't want to give Charlie a break. He did not want to give him a break of a $3.1 million offer and compromise on a $7 million in tax debt, nor did they want to give him a break by paying maybe $5 million or so, maybe $6 million, depending on, on when the statute, when the tax debt would drop off on a $7 million in tax debt in a partial payment installment agreement. So Charlie CPA took this matter to tax court, obviously, because I've been pulling these facts from the tax court petition that Charlie CPA filed for him. So I kind of went over this previously, but basically Charlie and his CPA argued in this task court petition that the IRS abused its discretion in several ways, namely by rejecting Charlie Sheen's offer and compromise, by failing to adequately and explicitly detail the basis and reasoning for the rejection, the rejection by the appeals area director, especially given that the appeals officer of the IRS's office of chief counsel had already approved the offer, by failing to consider Charlie Sheen's flexibility as to the terms of the offer and compromise, including the use of a future income collateral agreement by not acting in good faith, especially with respect to the Los Angeles area appeals director failing to communicate with Charlie's CPA and basically not even giving Charlie and his CPA a chance to respond to the area director's concerns with the offer. The petition states this is a clear breach of the duty of good faith and fair dealing, which is implicit in every contract. And finally, by depriving Charlie Sheen a further opportunity to administratively appeal the rejection of the offer in compromise. And on this basis, Charlie CPA requested the task court agree with him on these points, right? That the Los Angeles Area Appeals Director abused his discretion in rejecting Charlie's offer without explanation, right? The IRS refused to consider Charlie Sheen's willingness to, uh, to be flexible here. So on the basis of all this, Charlie CPA is arguing that the task court should remand the case back to appeals uh, and ideally at an appeals office outside the Los Angeles area where the Los Angeles area appeals director would not have any say. I don't quite know why this happened, but apparently on January 18, 2022, the IRS joined Charlie Sheen in a, in a joint request to remand his case back to appeals. And on January 24, 2022, the task court granted the motion to remand Charlie's case back to appeals for a hearing to be held no later than April 1st, 2022. It does not appear that it ordered that the meeting be held outside the Los Angeles area's jurisdiction, so I don't think that was granted. So now we're in the home stretch here, okay? Charlie's offered compromise is, is back in appeal and I couldn't find as much publicly available documents describing what went on during this last leg of the negotiations. But I do know that Charlie's final appeals hearing took place on May 10th, 2022 in Dallas. So even though the task court didn't order it, apparently Charlie and the IRS agreed to have a hearing outside the jurisdiction of the Los Angeles area director's power. 
And at that hearing in May 2022 in Dallas, an agreement was reached for an offer and compromise of $3.3 million with a future income collateral agreement. So Charlie now has an accepted offer and compromise by the IRS, right? So what did that mean? That means that Charlie had to pay the $3.3 million in full within five months of the offer acceptance. So that would be you know, May, June, July, August, September, October, May to June, July, yeah, by October. Presumably he's already done that. It says he also agreed to a future income collateral agreement, which as I explained previously is one of an offer and compromise amount is accepted on the condition that the taxpayer makes more than a certain amount of money in the future, the government will get a share of that. Okay. Thus end, that's, thus ends Charlie Sheen's offer in compromise drama. So that's the tale. Now, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from Charlie Sheen's tax ordeal that ultimately ended up with the IRS accepting an offer in compromise that cut what the famous actor owed by more than half, right? From somewhere around 7 million to 3.3 million, albeit with a future income collateral agreement. Well, here are five takeaways. Number one, you don't need to be dirt broke to qualify for an offer and compromise. The IRS determined that Charlie Sheen, even after paying all of his necessary living expenses, had disposable income every month of over $50,000 per month. He also has homes in Beverly Hills, Ventura County, and Rosarito, Mexico. Nevertheless, he was able to save almost $4 million by submitting an offer and compromise to the government. So don't listen to your friend or neighbor or another CPA or Dave Ramsey when they say you have to be absolutely scrounging for shrapnel to have an offer and compromise accepted. Number two, be aggressive. Be aggressive, but not frivolous with your offer and compromise submission so that you can offer concessions to the IRS if they ask for them and still be okay with the amount you're gonna have to pay. Remember, Charlie's first offer and compromise amount was only $1.2 million. Like I said earlier, I don't know exactly how Charlie's CPA came up with that amount. But my point is $1.2 million to offer is, is sounds kind of low, sounds pretty darn low, right? For someone with the income and assets of a Hollywood type like Charlie Sheen. And I think Charlie's CPA expected full well that the IRS would negotiate up, you know, which he and I imagine Charlie were fine with given how low their initial offer was. But the offer wasn't frivolous. It wasn't like, oh, you know, yeah, he's got all the stuff. He makes all this money, but we're only going to offer 50 grand, right? It was still a seven figure offer. So be aggressive, but don't be ridiculous. Whatever figure you come up with, you have to support it in a reasonable manner and in accordance with the IRS standards, the IRS rules for valuing things. Number three, don't give up. This offer and compromise process was a multi-year ordeal for Charlie Sheen. And it became embarrassing for him too. In fact, Charlie's CPA status report to the tax court regarding the 2015 tax year, he said that Charlie expressed concerns regarding the publicity that his case was attracting in the media. And so Charlie's CPA requested that the IRS would support a motion to seal the record in this case. The IRS declined, citing the Willie Nelson case from 1985. In that case, Willie Nelson wanted the legal record of his dispute with the IRS sale because it was embarrassing to him, right? That he's a famous musician, but you know he apparently can't pay the IRS. And the task court said no to Willie Nelson. It, it concluded the possibility that petitioner's status as nationally known entertainers may cause these cases to gain some notoriety is not a compelling enough reason to seal these records up to the time of trial. But guess what? Despite the embarrassment, Charlie didn't give up and Charlie's CPA didn't give up. They kept fighting and at the end of the day, they won. Yes, Charlie had to eventually pay $3.3 million to the IRS and possibly more in the future under the future income collateral agreement. But if you know his income stays the same for as long as that collateral agreement is in place, you know that means nearly $4 million of his original $7 million of debt would have been erased. Number four, don't assume the IRS knows more than you do. Remember how the IRS rejected Charlie's original offer and compromise and thought he had the potential to pay the IRS nine to $12 million? Well, what did Charlie's CPA do? Remember what I said? He took that denial letter, you know, that last offer specialist wrote denying Charlie's offer and compromise. And in that denial letter, I imagine she just tore apart Charlie's CPA's calculation of Charlie's reasonable collection potential amount. Charlie's CPA took that rejection and he wrote a detailed six page memorandum rebutting that denial of the offer point by point. And when he sat down, with that appeal settlement officer, they went through that rebuttal. And the settlement officer had to make some concessions, right? And these concessions were tied to the Internal Revenue Manual, which is the guidebook, which is kind of the, the Bible of, of IRS negotiations when it comes to collections. So either you need to know the Internal Revenue Manual really well, or you need to hire somebody who does. And that brings me to my next point. Number five, consider hiring a professional. Charlie obviously didn't go to bat himself to fight the IRS himself. He would have been crazy to do that. So he, his manager, rather, probably hired two competent tax professionals. He first hired a respected tax attorney, then handed the case off to a respected CPA to handle his case. 
he would have been bulldozed otherwise. So obviously when I say consider hiring a pro, I'm being somewhat self-serving here since I am a tax professional myself. I have a team of tax professionals at Choice Tax Relief. Every day we represent taxpayers before the IRS. We submit offers on compromise, installment agreements, and other tax relief options. If you wanna learn more about what these options are, give us a call 866-8000-TAX. That's 866-8089. Visit us at choicetaxrelief.com. I also have some more educational videos about how tax relief works over on the left-hand side of your screen. And I have a free ebook for you that you can download right now. You can click right below my face, the blue button right below my face. It's called Seven Secrets About Your Tax Set That the IRS Doesn't Want You To Know. Check that out. Check my videos out. Always be learning. Don't let the IRS push you around. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.